Oh, stop it. <laughs> oh, let me just take you in for a second, you remarkable sight. Oh, a wonderful cocktail of vibrancy and expectation. I love it. Taking you in, taking me in, <laughs> taking you in. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm used to my appearance provoking the full spectrum of facial reactions. Everywhere I show up, and you absolutely did not let me down. <laughs> you were delighted, weren't you? You gave me some wonderful face when I came up here. You looked at me like your mother-in-law just cancelled dinner. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to travel, and I'll never forget my first trip to Australia. I went to a place called Perth. I got off the plane. First person that saw me said the following. <clears throat> hey, mate! Hey, mate! Why is Freddie Mercury wearing a kimono? <laughs> huh. Hey, mate. Why is Freddie Mercury wearing a kimono. Now, this man opened the interaction with the words, hey, mate, our eyes met, right? I was the mate, case closed. <laughs> then he said, why is Freddie Mercury wearing a kimono? I looked around, there was nobody else there. <laughs> I was persons one and two in the rhetorical question. <laughs> I've never met this man, and already, grammatically, I'm on the back foot. <laughs> Put up with that. It would have been proud of me. You can't show any weakness. I summoned up every ounce of testosterone in my body and I fired it ocularly at this chap. And I said, I think you'll find that this is a smoking jacket. <laughs> yeah, I showed the <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot that's not made sense though. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that I still struggle with to this day is how uptight us Brits are. I didn't realise in the UK, how are you, is a rhetorical question. <laughs> how are you, is a rhetorical question. If somebody from the UK asks you how you are, and you tell them, they would be mortified. <laughs> now, there are geographical anomalies, I'm delighted to say. If you ask somebody from Liverpool how they are, they will tell you. 10 times out of 10, and I love them for that. Now, from personal experience, they oscillate wildly between two very distinctively different states. The first one is thus. Mm. How am I? I'm sound, mate. I'm buzzing. I'm having a belter. Do you know what? Wake sound. Air and doors is sound. Even our Anthony's being sound. Look at the weather, lad. Cracking the flags. I love you, cadet. <laughs> Apologies for the accent, by the way. Um, I have the ability to blend in seamlessly with my environment wherever I go. <laughs> I feel an energy, I match it, we become almost indistinguishable. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. Now, that's the first state. Now, the second state of Scouse being is rather different, and it is as follows. I'm fuming, lad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't you start, lad. I am fuming here, mate. I'm fuming. I am fuming. I'm up the wall with work. I've seen me <laughs> shoot my dad ever to be in shit again. You're doing my fing head in. I am fumigating naked. <laughs> There's so much that doesn't make sense. I'll tell you one thing uh, that I do struggle very much with uh, that, that makes no sense to me at all is the fact that the nurses in this country have had to strike for better conditions and better pay. <laughs> Natural insanity. <laughs> but. <laughs> I've just found out about something called dopamine. Now, dopamine is a reward chemical in the brain. Every time somebody does something nice for somebody else, they get this huge drug-like rush of dopamine through their system, this enormous narcotic hit. Essentially, nature's cocaine. 
Well, I mean, cocaine is nature's cocaine. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make, all of the do-gooders, all of the good Samaritans, myself included, all of us, junky scum. <laughs> junky scum getting our dopamine fix off the needs of the needy, and this has been going on for decades. Why do you think Sir Bob Geldof slurs his words so much? <laughs> These people are everywhere. There'll be somebody in your book club, sir. I guarantee it. Oh, I see Kenneth was clearing the weeds from the paving stones in front of the church. Yeah, I bet he was the skaghead. <laughs> and this brings me to the point. The worst offenders, the crack addicts of the care world, the nurses. Good luck. Why do you think these people can tirelessly work 18-hour shifts? I'll tell you why. They're all chongoed out the wazzy on dopamine. <laughs> oh, I need that change in love. Mm. <laughs> and some of these people will go home and help folk in their spare time just to keep the buzz going. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it like that, why are they even paid? <laughs> this is clearly why the government hates them so much. <laughs> And what were we doing a couple of years ago? We were out on the streets banging cutlery for these people. <laughs> we had our saucepans and our crockery and we were banging away for them. Why don't we perform a hacker for the Weatherspoon's day drinkers while we're at it? <laughs> it's six o'clock, everyone. Let's do a Macarena for the backheads. Come on. <laughs> do, we, do we have any nurses here? You made me sick! <laughs> you made me sick. And then you make me better. <laughs> which makes you high, which makes me sick. It never ends. <laughs> now, I, I know why the nurses are mistreated. If we're talking, you know, on straight terms, and I'll tell you why. 90% of nurses are women. And it is not a level playing field for you women. I found that out. I've consumed an awful lot of literature on the subject. The most clear and decisive indication on exactly how unfair it is for you women is in a series of books called The Mr. Men. <laughs> Vile, sexist propaganda. The author, Roger Hargreaves, a men's rights activist decades ahead of his time. <laughs> Do you know what he called his female protagonists? He called them Little Miss. Patronising. Why are none of them allowed to get married? <laughs> it gets worse. Get your heads around this. Every single Little Miss, every single one, is the villain of her own story. Genuinely. Like little Miss Naughty, right? She's, she's careening around being naughty. It's a name. It's a job. She's carrying on like a tiny purple Liam Gallagher. <laughs> Just being herself. Living her best life. The Mr. Men, they don't like that. They form a kangaroo court, and they have Mr. Strong grab her nose to stop her, and that works, and that's the end of the story. <laughs> and the moral from Roger Hargreaves, women, know your place. <laughs> it's so much worse. The entire storyline of Little Miss Chatterbox, beginning, middle and end. Quiet love, men are talking. <laughs> Trust me, I have missed nothing from the narrative arc there. She talks, they don't like it, they shut her up, everybody's happy. <laughs> Little Miss Neat leaves her house. It's in perfect order. You know, she's riddled with obsessive compulsive disorder, but that does have its fringe benefits. The house is immaculate. <laughs> While she's away, Mr. Muddle comes in, uninvited, and attempts to make himself a cup of tea, during the process of which he levels the entire house top to bottom. <laughs> and then leaves, never punished in the narrative at any point. According to Roger, he's fine. Little Miss Neat comes back and has to tidy everything up herself. And the moral of that one, men should never have to make the tea. <laughs> Seems very much to me that every time Roger Hargreaves had an argument with his wife... <laughs> every time 
she got on the wrong side of him, a brand new Little Miss character was created. <laughs> You've been to the shops. Did you remember my pipe tobacco? No, no, it's fine. You, you just get on. I'm, I'm just going to get on with my work. All right. Little Miss Forgetful. I'm <laughs> Could you imagine in your relationship if every tiny domestic mistake that you made was turned into a colourful caricature by this man, translated into 86 different languages and published around the world? Little Miss Paranoid as f <laughs> You wouldn't get free. Oh, oh, uh, what about the men? Mr. Perfect, Mr. Happy, Mr. Strong. Where's Mr. Afraid of Commitment? <laughs> Where is Mr. Emotionally Unavailable? <laughs> Where's Mr. Passive Aggressive? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you where he is. He's writing the damn books. That's where he is. <laughs> and the less said about Mr. Tickle. <laughs> this is from that grim tone sitting in his armchair in his house at the other side of the wood. He laughed and laughed every time he thought about all the people he had tickled. <laughs> it's practically Prince Andrew's biography for Christ's sake. One more time for Troy Hawk!